Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And the first thing we're going to show him is this image. It was referred to by John McDonnell. Um, it's in the Yorkshire Evening Post. Um, and the front it, page it, of the mirror. And the front page of the mirror. You're quite right. Thank you for coming in on me there. Um, and this is a four-year-old with suspected pneumonia forced to sleep on the floor of Leeds General Infirmary due to lack of beds. What's your response, Paul? Yeah, it's terrible. No one should have to, uh, obviously, um, un you know, undergo that... Uh, um, level of service, as it were, in, 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 in a hospital. But I'm glad to see that, that actually they, there is an ex investment that's going in already to expand the children's unit there and to build a new hospital in that in, in, in Leeds as well. Right, but, who, but who's been in charge of the but, NHS? But who's been in charge of the <clears throat> NHS since 2010? Well, none, nonetheless, as I say, this is why we need to make sure that there's enough money going in now yeah. to avoid that from happening again. Well, what was again, wrong with putting in more uh, money earlier? No, what I'm saying, well, you've actually just been talking about uh, the fact that we've been picking up the pieces from the, uh, the structural deficit. No, we, we, haven't, we haven't been talking well, about that, actually. Well, well, in terms uh, we've been of talking, about, Labor, opening, we've been talking about Labour's economic programme. Let's just focus on what we are talking about and what we've shown our viewers um, here. And that is a four-year-old sleeping on the floor of a big hospital. The hospital's apologised. Um, this happened a few <coughs> days ago. You've been in charge of the NHS for ten years. Is that acceptable? No, I say that's not acceptable. I started off by yeah. saying that's acceptable. Right, so but, but, acceptable. There's two things. But why there's haven't there's you two put more money well, no, in? Why are you only putting it in because now? There's two things. No, no, there's two things here. First of all, yes, we need to put more money in, and we are. That's why we're pledging uh, £34 billion pounds over the next now, few years. Now, hang on. I've got, now, I'm, I'm um, going to have to interrupt you there. You've got to stop using that figure, because that is a cash figure. The real figure is £20.5 billion. Pounds. Based on assumptions of inflation, but there's £34 billion pounds of actual money... Right, but that, so, that, is how, but that is how you know, we measure my, the amount of money going I, in. Yeah, so shall we just call it... Let, let's, just, let's just be <clears> consistent. <throat> let's just call it £20.5 billion pounds in real terms by 2023-24. Joe, let's be consistent. There's more money than ever before going into the NHS as a result of this. But that's not sorting out this problem. What I was going to say is the second issue of this is how that money is spent. And it's really important. We've just been talking about nationalisation and other forms of spending that the Labour Party are proposing. And a lot of that is dogmatic. It's, it's actually uh, to fill in the political... Yeah. Political theory. What actually uh, a lot of the money that we're going to be investing in the NHS and are investing in the NHS yeah, but needs you're to not, go But this is not a record. Is this is not services. a record increase. Let's just be clear. It's lower. Actually, no, what I'm saying. it's lower than the average increase in the post-war period. No, and that's according to the IFS. No, you're talking about increases. Well, I'm just talking about the fact that there's more money than ever gone before in the NHS the, that will be going... That's, that's that what is, I'm saying. But that is the cash figure, and that's why we need to talk mm. about a real-terms figure. Now, I'm not going to spend the whole of this interview debating a figure with you when I am very clear, as are the IFS and as are government figures, this is £20.5 billion. Pounds. And actually, the increase is lower than the historic average into the NHS. Joe, now, I'm happy then to discuss further than that, but those are the figures. But Joe, you, you asked about this, this poor boy that's... Uh, that's, uh, that's um, no, I've been talking about the that's figures. You, yeah, but that's how you started off the, um, the, the, the interview, talking right, about so this poor but boy. Are you going to stick to and the what figures I, what that I I'm using? To, what I want to know, what I want to be able to, to make sure is that this is not happening again. And it's partly due to money, but what I'm saying is also how that money is spent. What we can't have is dogmatic spending, as we've just heard from John McDonnell. We've got to make sure that everything has a, mm. a, a way of getting to the front line. Right. Uh, you know, th there are ways that the, the, the hospitals that are being built, for example, I know from my own... How many area, hospitals are being know, built, by the way? There are six immediately, there's right. 20 coming up, and then there's... Uh, and, and, right, and again, you haven't been clear on that, but we no, are we challenging... No, we have. We oh, no, we have. I can, I, can happily, I can happily go right. through that but if you want to, But we are challenging your claims about record levels of investment in the NHS. Yes, they are not record levels. We are not talking about cash terms, we're talking about real but you, terms. But you, and then we can have a sensible conversation. Well, no, because sh we've shifted on already from the first question that you asked about this poor boy in Leeds. In, in, in Leeds. Um, yes, because, because actually, you then immediately went to the figures that you're putting into the NHS Joe, what now. I'm saying, what I'm saying is not just about cash. We organise that money, spend that money in the best way so it's seen at the front line of services rather than dogmatic spending. Why, did, why, why haven't party. you put more funding in earlier? <clears throat> 
Well, we have. We increased... No, early, we, well, uh, we, earlier, we increased, as in over the last well, nine years? We, we increased our NHS funding um, uh, last year. People were, you know, were talking about... We put in £390 million a week more uh, under Theresa May. You'll have the, you'll have the uh, real terms figure adjusted for inflation. And, All right, and, let's and move as long on. as it's more money going in and people seeing... No, it's the not good enough just to say that no. as long as well, it's more Joe, money going You have to be accurate about well, what I'll you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you what, when about. I walk... Right now, in a number of states, the laws allow a baby to be born from his or her mother's womb in the ninth month. It is wrong. It has to change. But we have you seen making, the photo, Prime we need Minister? To be making, have you seen no, the photo? I've been told about it by the BBC. You, we need to be making investments. This is, the photo, this is the photo. We need to be making investments now. And that's why we're putting £34 billion this, pounds This is a four-year-old boy, Prime and Minister, suspected of pneumonia. Forced to lie on, on, on the floor on a pile of coats. I understand. And, and obviously, we have every possible sympathy for everybody who has a bad experience in the NHS. 40 new hospitals. I'm talking about this boy, know, Prime Minister. How do you feel looking at that photo? Of course. And let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you that I, I haven't had a chance to look at that. I'll look, I'll Why don't look at it now, Prime Minister? I'll study it in a, I'll study look later. at it now. This is Jack I'm, Willimon. I'm, if, if you don't mind, I'll, 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 give, you an, I'll give you an interview uh, now. What we, are, what we are doing is we are talking with. Families you refuse to look at the photo. You've taken my phone, put it in your pocket, Prime Minister. His mother says the NHS is in crisis. What's your response? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, I, I, it's, a, it's a terrible, terrible photo. And, I'm, and I apologise, obviously, to the families and all those who, who, who have terrible experiences in the NHS. But uh, what, we are, what we are doing, the Sturgeon in coalition. And I'm sorry to have taken your phone. There you, there you go. Sorry. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's hear from Adam on how he's going to vote if he's decided. Have you, have you Adam? Um, I'm telling you how I'm doing this, Sheila. Normally, I'm a classic voting vote, floating voter. Yeah. I make two lists, a list of positives for a party and a list for negatives. And I always look at the positives and everything and I cast my vote there. For this election, this is the first time in my 54 years of life that I'm thinking I'm going to vote for the party with the least negatives. That's how bad it's got. I'm going to vote for the party with the least negatives. And I've been keeping this in a little notebook over the past couple of months. And who have you come up with? Uh, narrowly, very narrowly, and only by default, the least negatives are actually with the Conservative Party at the moment. Probably not with their leader, but with their manifesto, uh, that's where the least negatives lie at the moment. Right. This is like this is like that that scene in Friends, isn't it? That episode where Ross keeps a makes a list of Rachel's pros and cons. Are you familiar with the series Friends, Adam? I, I am. Yes, <laughs> yes. I remember that. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, just like uh, Ross did. There's a few kind of few major ones and everything like that. Probably doesn't equate to uh, to Rachel, but chubby um, ankles. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. There were there were a few major ones uh, that were up at the top that I was looking at. And what were um, they? What what's What's the negative well, on the Labour side for you, the big negative? Uh, big negative, the inheritance tax, you're going to make a lot of people poor, you're going to make a lot of people very difficult to get on the housing ladder uh, with uh, parents' um, houses they'll be handing down, which they've already paid tax twice on. Now, I was a Remain voter, but do you know what I think now? Get Brexit done and let's get moving forward. Uh, by the way, uh, I've seen the parties stall. We've had this election because of all the stalling that's been going on over over Brexit. And I would actually think if I had to cast my vote again now, after I've seen how the parties have behaved, I'd vote for Brexit. Also, another thing that really put me off with Labour is the thought of actually having Diane Abbott in charge of our uh, security policy and in charge of uh, home security. But you're okay with Pretty Patel? Yes. Okay. Not, um, oh, not go on. perfect, but she, nobody's perfect. As a character, as a character, but as uh, policy driven, I would be a lot better with Pretty Patel's policies. Maybe not the person herself, but with her policies so than you're, uh, you're, Diane Abbott's, which is dangerous. So you're, you're focusing your negatives on Diane Abbott because of her policies or, or her person. Okay. I would say with, uh, definitely her policies and the way that she actually conveys um, what, setting out her agenda. Um, I, absolutely. And did any of the other parties get a look in or were you just keeping a Labour Conservative list? I had a look at the Greens, absolutely crazy. Uh, I'm very calm, I'm, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I'll be putting that to Jonathan Bartley later, my goodness. <laughs> absolutely crazy. 
What's, yeah, what's crazy? What's crazy about the Greens? Um, what's crazy Lib about the Greens? Um, hang on, Adam. No, no, no. Hang on. I want to linger on the Greens for a minute because we've got their co-leader in later. What's crazy about the Greens? Yes, their policies on defence, their policies on immigration, it would be virtually an open door immigration policy without any, without a very uh, strong filtering system, which um, which this country needs. Um, they would uh, virtually be dismantling the defence of this country at a time when we are in a living in very uncertain times. Okay, well, we'll put that to him later, Adam, when he comes into the, when he joins us. He's not coming into the studio, sorry. When he joins us uh, for a conversation later on, uh, do we have time for Frank? We do before three. Hello, Frank. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Labour government, 1964 to 70, had to devalue the currency. Labour government, 74 to 79, had to have a bailout. Inflation went 26%. Labour government, 1997 to 2010, they left the note saying there's no money left. There also won't be tough on immigration. And at the moment, we have 72,000 people from the European Union on the unemployment register and 186,000 from the rest of the world on the unemployment register. Uh, if we stay in the EU, we won't be able to stop the export of live animals, livestock, and uh, we won't be able to take VAT off domestic fuel for the poorest in our society. And the European Union has been a disaster for some countries, some young people that have the euro as a currency, Greece, Italy, etc. Absolute disaster, catastrophe, mass unemployment, huge rides and mental depression and worse. So I think the only choice is Conservative or the Brexit Party. All right, Frank, thank you. Shirley's decided. Uh, what have you decided, Shirley? Well, I'll be um, voting Labour, Sheila, after swearing I would never vote Labour again after Tony Blair took us into the Iraq war. But um, I will be voting Labour, and it's because of Jeremy Corbyn I will be voting Labour. And, and what about him? It's it's not just about him not being Tony Blair, is it? <laughs> no. Well, you know, at first um, when he he um, became the party leader, I was, well, you know, initially surprised. He's never been one of those politicians who's pushed himself forward as a leader. And I do have memories of him taking on Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair and... Um, you, you know, um, the bankers in the Oxford Union and, you know, so I had memories of him as a backbencher, as a young person interested in politics and was surprised that he um, became the party leader. I think he was surprised and I was that he became surprised. the party leader. Yeah. Pardon? I think he was surprised he became the party leader. <laughs> I think ultimately. he was and, you know, was that reluctance? You know, he hasn't got that narcissistic kind of ego that we've seen in so many leaders, including Boris Johnson, to say the least. That really has rekindled my interest in the whole Labour movement. So is it the man or is it the policies? Or is it the man both? and his policies. You know, um, Sheila, the three things that recur both in the press, on the doorstep, anywhere you go, in a pub, in a shop, you hear people saying, oh, he's anti-Semitic, which is not true. That's totally unfounded. And I did a lot of work and looking into that. You know, he is... Shirley, I can't, about, let, Shirley, I can't let you say yes. it's totally unfounded, that there, is, there, that, that there is, isn't a problem is. of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. But do you accept he, there's a problem in the Labour Party that needs addressing and, and is being I addressed? Accept, I accept he is the first leader in the Labour Party to put policies into practice to address it. And yes, and I, for one, I'm very sorry to find there's any, there's any anti-Semitism at all, not just in the party, but in this country. Jewish people went through a lot during um, the Second World War. However, what um, Corbyn stands for is he stands against what Israel is doing to Palestine. And a lot of Jewish people stand against what Israel is doing to Palestine. And he's the first. Labour leader, ever stand up and say? And, all right, and can I? That's your view. Can I? Can I ask you um, mm -hmm. uh, why it is, in your view, that yes. uh, that um, a, 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 that, that a party leader, given what's going on in our own country, um, yes. that a party leader should become so synonymous with with one issue um, 
in yes. in the Middle East. Do you, do you see what I'm asking? Yes. It's, I mean, the, the, it's a very I'm important not, issue. I'm not minimising is the issue, really but when you look at what when you look at what families behind doors in their homes in this country, day in day out, are looking for in a political leader, do you think it is their position on I Israel? Think and because, I think he's become synonymous with it because he abhors what Israel, and let's not confuse Israel as being representative of all Jewish people, the Israeli government... Any more, Shirley, any more than I would uh, equate every person living in Gaza with Hamas. But Hamas kills Jewish but people Hamas in Israel. Hamas was elected uh, one time, you know, let's not forget that. Well, so know, is the Israeli um, government. Yes, I know, but it's not um, the... But, 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 but do, do you accept that Hamas is a terrorist organisation? I mean, I, I'm kind of sorry we're talking about this because I, I think, you know, the day before an election in the UK, given the state our nation is in, w yes. it, I, I would have imagined that with a Labour voter calling, we'd be, we'd be talking about uh, more domestic issues closer to home. I but but given that we're there, do you accept that Hamas is a terrorist organisation that I wants Israel that, off the map? That. It wants Israel off the map. I think It wants Jews you know, out of the Middle if East. You look at I think what's happened is no, Israel... Well, we can talk about the other way around in a minute, well, but do you accept that that's Hamas's position? Because it I is, Shirley. They have taken a terrorist... You know, we say one, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. OK, well, I, they, well, there you go. That's what Shirley thinks. Let's hear from James before we go to the news headlines. James, hi. Hi, Sheila. Good afternoon. Sheila, just very briefly, because I know you don't have any time. I have... I've, got, we've got to, I've got all the time in the world. You're okay. okay. I would never call you Shirley either. <laughs> no. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I've been called worse. <laughs> I don't believe it. Oh, Sheila, I, I um, uh, having been a Remainer, you know, consistently mad at Mr. Johnson and the way he's conducted himself and Theresa May and never voted anything but New Labour or Lib Dem in my life. As a Jew, and that's not my overriding reason, but as a Jew, first and foremost, I couldn't countenance voting for uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And I see no point in voting for the Lib Dems uh, because the best you could hope for if you did would be an alliance with Mr Corbyn and he would be Prime Minister. And I dislike the fact that she voted for every austerity measure that there was in the uh, coalition. And I have to vote for Mr. Johnson. How and do you I feel? How do you feel about that ICM poll that Theo was talking about with me earlier on? Um, yeah. That a third of Conservative voters yes. um, uh, uh, have feel negatively towards Muslims. Well, I was. This is the other thing I was. I was trying to say to myself: if Mr. Corbyn and it wasn't the Jews, it was the Muslims, would I decide that would put me off voting for him? And I would like to hope that it would. Um, but, you know, it, it's an impossible... But it, but, 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 uh, it, but it isn't putting you off voting Conservative, even though that's a Conservative statistic I just gave you. It, 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 it is not putting me off voting Conservative because, and I, I know I can say this because I'm not a Muslim, but I don't believe the uh, Islamophobia in the Conservatives Party is as bad or as widespread from what I've read. But if I, I said to you one third of Labour voters yes. think Jews can't be trusted or think Jews think negatively That's about right. Jews. Absolutely, yeah. It's, um, you only needed to read all the comments in the Sunday Times. No, but what I'm saying to you is if I it's it, it I, I know I know they're not the same because of the yes. deep horrific history of anti-Semitism in the world and not yeah. least its apex, the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but I'm just curious, given that racism against Jews is why you can't vote for Jeremy Corbyn, that yeah. ICM poll shows mm. a distinct... I'm not talking about the, the party here. We're talking about sure. people who vote Conservative. Yes. You know, that's a big number saying they have negative feelings towards Muslims and yet you're comfortable I... to vote with that party. I, I'm not comfortable, Sheila, at all. I mean, I am totally, I despise Mr. Johnson uh, 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 completely. 100%. How can you vote for a party whose leader you despise? Because the leader sets the tone. Jeremy because, Corbyn is setting a tone, and that tone, in part, is anti-Semitic in nature. And uh, Boris Johnson has set the tone in the Conservative Party, particularly in this election campaign, and that tone is dishonesty. 
absolutely. I, I, Sheila, you, you, I sit here racking my my head. It, it, it is astonishing that I've come to this uh, 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 impasse in, in in my voting intentions. They're not the only two parties, you know. Well, uh, well, I could vote for the Greens, I suppose. Um, uh, the poor old Greens. We've got the leader well, on in a minute. We've, sorry, but... we've got the leader, the co-leader, I should say, of the Greens, Jonathan Bartley, on in a moment. We'll we'll put to him that people keep saying, oh, I suppose I could vote for the Greens. See, I'm, I'm sure he's well used to it. We'll see what he says about that. Thank you, James, for your call uh, on how you intend to vote. John has called. Hello. Hello, Sheila. How are you doing? Um, I'm good, yeah. How are you? I'm OK. Have you decided... Um, no, I'm still undecided. Um, the issues for me are climate change and animal welfare. And out of the three main parties, Labour seems to be the strongest on climate change as they have a zero emissions target um, at the end of 2030s. And they are intent to engage in farming by 2025, which is important as millions of chickens are still kept in cages. Yeah. However, I'm leaning towards the Greens as Labour would still allow battery chickens to be slaughtered by electrical stunning, which for financial reasons uses low currents, so means they're often conscious when they go into the hot power pool for defeathering. So I'm undecided whether to vote for a party like Labour, which have good policies in these areas, or to vote Green, um, which have superior policies. And then I could kind of send a clear signal to the main parties that they need to improve their environmental and animal welfare policies. And for you, it's for you that these are the two areas that have decided your vote, not Brexit, not your job, not the economy, but specifically um, animal rights. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I care a lot about the elderly. Um, for me, I've had um, a very negative um, experiences with mental health um, where I felt kind of quite out of control and um, I, I felt like I was very reliant on other people to kind of speak up for me and get me to get help. And because of that, I feel I like to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, so particularly animals. Um, but then in the same way, you know, I'm very passionate about elderly people with dementia or people um, who kind of have locked in syndrome or disabilities where they can't, you know, state their needs. So um, I, I think I kind of... Uh, on the side of animals because I think people mainly focus on human issues because we're around them all the time but I still you know care deeply about them as well and it has been your deciding factor yes yeah yeah okay. um, well, everybody's got their own deciding factors you know people are voting on all kinds of levels thank you John for your call uh, James has called hello James hello there your Brexit party your voting Brexit party yes yes um, main reason being is that I feel that they're the only democratic party on the whole list. And they're the only ones who have upheld the uh, referendum and um, and everyone else is ignoring the EU and they're, they're ignoring Agenda 21 from the EU. And I find that so crazy. So unimaginable. You know, that people haven't looked into these things. They don't know what Agenda 21 is. They don't even know what it is. Yet, they're, they're, oh, that's all right. We'll vote for that. You haven't got a clue, people. You haven't got a clue. I bet after these people out there, you ask them, what's Agenda 21 from the European Union? What is it? They'll go, oh, I don't know. What, do you, what do you oh, say exactly. is coming? What do you say is coming? <sighs> Consolidation of the world, basically, under one uh, global power. This is, this is... Well, OK. Uh, that's not true. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response, were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Before we do that, let me turn to some of the emails, because we're having problems with the calls. Uh, with the phones, I should say. Uh, Jack's opinion. Uh, Greta appears too self-righteous to me. She doesn't know how not to be, I don't understand what that means, because of her age. The message is great, but the delivery is poor. Uh, this comes from Dom. How come this girl's parents haven't been nicked for her not attending school? I think they're probably on a, a greater plane now. Uh, and lastly, this comes from Len. I'd like to know who writes all of her speeches. I don't believe it can be her, as while she reads them very well, I've seen occasions when she's unable to answer any questions. Well, I think the woman, uh, the young lady has uh, a condition, doesn't she? 
I think she's has Asperger's syndrome or whatever it is, so we, we need to be aware of that. Now, let's try again with Bill in Faversham. Bill, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Bill, you're on the radio. Good morning. Hello, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Yes, sir. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, I think it devalues the prestige of the Time Award. And the reason is, Nick, if you were going into a really important LBC meeting, or yep. if you were going in to have an operation, a serious operation at a hospital, right. a 16-year-old with a script walked in, how would you feel about that? Well, there's no way they could have... I think, to be a surgeon, you're looking at five or seven years' training. It's never going to happen. So well, exactly. It's, it's not so a why are we but, listening to a 16-year-old with a script? But, but it's not a fair analogy. She's, she, do you, but oh, global the, warming is supposed to, and climate change or whatever they call it now, is supposed to be more important than an individual problem. Right. And she's coming in and lecturing people. It, it's ridiculous. Basically, she's a sock puppet for whoever is behind all of this. Well... <laughs> Okay, I mean those are rather strong words. You you yeah. don't you don't think that there's any climate issues on the planet at all? No, there are lots of issues. Plastic and pollution are very very important, but there are lots of other things. They say all the science but, is in agreement, and whenever you hear that, you should run for the hills. Okay, so whenever I, they said in other sciences, it's been wrong. I hear you, but do you not think that? The very fact that she is so young is what gives her... If she were a professor in his or her mid-40s, it wouldn't have the same impact as a girl who started school strikes, would it, in all that, honesty? That's absolutely true, and that's why she's been introduced, because they thought if they put a young girl up who looks even younger than her years, she wouldn't be criticised, whereas a professor would. I hear what you're saying, Bill. We do have to sort of... A afford her a certain degree of credit for what she has achieved. Bill, thank you for that. Sorry we had the hitch on the phones. I think it might have been me pressing the wrong button, so I'm sorry if I cut you off. Bill, thank you. We will move on. Let's talk about St. Greta of Thunberg is now Time Magazine Person of the Year. John F. Kennedy, Mother Teresa, the Apollo astronauts. Luminary Company, indeed. Matt in High Wycombe, is it deserved? Good morning. Uh, yes, Nick, for me it is deserved. Um, of course, she's a very high-profile face. She's of 16. An important movement. Yeah, that's fair enough. But um, if you look at the people who've been given Time Magazine's uh, Person of the Year, they include Stalin and Hitler, but that's what they I don't do. want, want to talk about. Um, mm. I do appreciate your discussion, Nick, but you've kind of missed the point, which I think Mr. Oh. Thunberg would make herself, that the science is more important than the person. But as usual, because people can't combat or deal with the science, they engage with the person being Greta Thunberg. Mm. Um, so... What I would say is you have a duty to inform. There's no problem with having people from Spike Don, but they have taken something like $300,000 admitted by Brendan Neal, who leads uh, Spike uh, online. Hang on, hang on. Let, uh, uh, they're not here to defend themselves. What, what, is, what is, just be more broad, broad in your uh, allegation. W what are your worries about having a discussion concerning Greta Thunberg then? It, are you not allowed to be a dissenting voice? They're definitely allowed to be dissenting voices, but if those voices are paid by fossil fuel interests, right. then maybe, just maybe, Nick, you have a duty first to research and second to disclose. And thirdly, what I would say is, in terms of the science, you were bad at science in high school, fine, that's fair enough. You yeah, have well, a very, very high p profile here yeah. to educate and inform. Yeah. Surely it's up to you to get yourself across the science, which is both complicated, but also not that hard to understand. It is for me. It's kind of your job to be no, informed, mate. No, and here you are, not being no, informed. No, On radio, it, being no, paid to be uninformed. No, 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 no. It is for me. And my, my job is to also reflect both sides. There are people, of course, who say that the world is not as precariously poised as some would have it. Now, and I don't know. those people have relevant degrees. What, so you're only allowed an opinion? I, I, mate... No, I don't have a degree, saying, and I'm what never going to have a degree in this in this okay, so, sphere. Let, let's let's put it this way, Nick. Let's say a man tell a doctor tells you you have cancer, right? Mm -hmm. I'll go and get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. What we have here with climate change is one doctor says it's definitely climate change. The next doctor says it's definitely climate change. Ninety-seven out of a hundred doctors say it's definitely climate change. They come from countries all over the world, some of which with massive oil reserves. Russia, China, places that use fossil fuels like crazy. Mm -hmm. But people like you want to call it even. Why? Because I have to reflect the other side of the coin. But that's not the other side of the coin. That's well, 3% yeah. of the coin. Well, no. Hold on, mate. Hold on. The lev I have accepted, obviously, the, that the planet is, as I think I've used the word already, a precarious position.
but we can't right. ju we can't just necessarily swallow the science wholesale and just say that's it end of you have no one's to asking you, you to. This well, is I, a multilateral, I, I, I sent, I sent you are. That literally you, you said that every, every scientist we go to says it's a problem, so it must be a problem. That's not what I said, Nick. What I well, said is 97 get... out of 100 scientists say that it is a problem. Well, then we have to reflect the views of the three, don't we? Oh, really? And are you going to give them 3% of the airtime, Nick, or 50% of the airtime? Because if you are, then what you're doing is favouring a massive, tiny minority argument and giving it equal weighting with an argument that actually is based in science. Okay. I think if you were to reflect the views of people in a restaurant, in a coffee shop today, they would not necessarily all be as strident as you are, and they would appreciate hearing what the other views... You're citing research, 97 out of 100. I'm sure I could find research where I so motivated and had the time that would make another picture, uh, paint a different picture. And that's what we have to reflect. Matt, I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. 839. I'm neither an expert in gang crime. I've not done a study of that, and I don't happen to have been a drug-pushing gangster, but hopefully I can have a conversation about that. Mind you, reflect the other view, much to Matt's anger, but Anne Cooper says, come back and talk to me about Greta Thunberg after she's worked for 10 years and paid her taxes. Scott in Bexley Heath. Scott, do you think she should have got this award? Good morning. Abs absolutely not. Good morning, Nick. Absolutely not. Why not, sir? Uh, well, personally, I, I believe that it should have collectively been given to the Hong Kong protesters. Yeah, um, actually, simply, yeah. Sim mm. Simply because they're doing a much more, um, you know, <laughs> on-the-ground substantial issue mm -hmm. where they're actually fighting for something. Well, um, she would argue she's fighting, of course. She, she could argue to the cows come home. U ultimately, her, her cause is completely is, is completely nonsensical. It mm. takes absolute it, it takes absolute arrogance of anyone to sit there and genuinely believe that after the Earth, which is a billion years old, <laughs> survived multiple, uh, countless extinction level events, uh, undergone except, uh, uh, unlimited amounts of can catastrophes, civilized uh, civilization ending the uh, Earth. Uh, historical events as well several multiple world wars well, yeah all of a, yeah all of a sudden people are, are going to put on, on a billion year old earth that is going to end in 12 years it's well I, I, I remind you of what one of my earlier callers matt said that there are over 100 scientists uh, i don't know quite the scale but 97 of them support what greta thunberg is saying but, but with all due respect Nostradamus was also uh, was, was was also a, a form of scientist, and there was plenty of scientists as well going back to the Greeks, where they claimed doomsday events were okay. going to happen. You, you don't and, and buy it. You don't buy it at all. Out of interest, Scott. It, it, it's, it's not that I don't buy it. The, the, the thing is, I feel that the issue is being conflated. Climate change and environmental change are two different things. Climate change is, is caused by the Earth's solio, solar axial position in orbit of the sun. Whoa. Environmental change with plastics in, 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 the, in the ecosystem, um, paper and waste and, and you know, stuff and pollution, those things are actually caused by humans. Those things are, can be directly changed. And many would argue that's what Greta's trying to make awareness of. Scott, thank you. Emma has called from Bromley. Hello, Emma. Oh, hi, Sheila. Thank you for having me on. Um, my person of the year, a bit contentious. I really like Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to watch the program years ago, you know, the... Um, Apprentice. Yes, the American Apprentice. Mm. And I was just really impressed with how his mind works and his decision-making skills. Um, so I've just, I've liked him a long time. Um, I read one of his books a long time ago. Don't ask me what it said, but I quite enjoyed it. And um, well, that's very Trumpian. I can't remember a single thing about it, but it was great. Believe me, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it was great, but I I've followed the guy a long time, and <laughs> I I watch his rallies on Google, and oh my goodness, he's so funny. He's a real showman. Um, he loves to work the crowd. Um, they're all in stitches. They're all having great fun. Um, he's, he's a natural comedian. Um, when he does the, what, who, who are the two, the two lovers that were, the, uh, um, that were sort of colluding to, to get him impeached or what have you. And he, oh, Lisa, I love you. And, oh, I love you. And <laughs> he's just, I, I, I think he's great. And, do you think you know, he's funny? Do you think so he's, well. do you think he's funny when he makes racist remarks? Do you think he's funny when he, uh, criticizes the grieving mother of an American veteran? Do you think it's funny when he attacks democracy in America? Do you think those things are funny? I've never witnessed any of that. Have you not? Have you not got a telly? I have, but um, 
Well, the, the press was saying he was he made racist marks about Mexicans. I mean, if you watch the full clip, he actually criticised um, certain gang members that come over and do hideous things. Something 13, M13 or something, some particular gang that come over from Mexico. He didn't say it. He's got... I mean, I've got friends that are... Um, uh, Latino um, over in America, and they love him. They think he's absolutely brilliant. So he, he was only criticising the, these very foul gang members. So, so you like him? Um, you know, he, his character appeals to you, his humour appeals to you. Um, but what about him? Uh, it, do you think would would place him on the front? I mean, he's been on the front of Time magazine, I think. Um, what, uh, well, what, I what think, about um, him would 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 give him that honour? Well, the fact that he's created. Um, thousands and thousands of jobs um, through bringing back industry, uh, the way America is just doing so well economically, it's just incredible um, how he, you know employment figures for the black community are the lowest they've ever been, or at least they've been in 50 years or something, I mean it's just you know, Obama said, oh, you need a magic wand to bring back industry and this and that. Obama didn't have a clue. He was he was a community organizer or whatever he was. He didn't understand business and industry. And Trump does. And, and America has benefited just massively from that. And the way he sticks up to them uh, with doing, you know, how he wants to do these trade deals and what have you and how he puts his country first uh, I just think it's it's really excellent, and how he's and what he's been put through with all the witch hunts and the uh, trying to impeach him, and how you know I, I just really really admire his um, his strength and his. Acumen. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I have to say, I mean, it's almost as though someone uh, set you up as a joke to me. But I, mean, I know that I can hear you're sincere, but I couldn't agree. I couldn't disagree with you more. <laughs> On that's okay, isn't it? In of a, in course, a... it's okay. Of course, it's okay. But I couldn't disagree with you more. And uh, if you, if that impeachment stuff is getting on your nerves, we're going to talk about it in fifteen minutes. Sorry about that, Emma. Thank you, Emma in Romley. Donald Trump is her person of the year. Uh, before I get back to more of your calls, let's look to the states for a few minutes. Uh, my first caller, who loved Donald Trump, might be uh, made uncomfortable by this. But anyway, let's do it. David K. Johnston um, uh, joins me. Good afternoon to you, David. Good afternoon. And um, for people who might not be familiar with you, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporter, investigative reporter and author of The Making of Donald Trump. And, and another, it's even worse than you think, what the Trump administration is doing to America. And I, I'm doing a, an hour with my callers um, uh, as we speak about uh, th who their person of the year is. We know that Greta Thunberg is the time person of right. the year. My first caller said Donald Trump and was saying, um, you know, praising him to, to the rafters and saying that he has been smart on job creation. He's been smart on the economy. Um, he's leagues ahead of Barack Obama. What do you say to that? Well, job growth was faster under Barack Obama after the economy that he inherited turned around. Remember, Obama took office, there were 750,000 jobs a month being lost. Once that turned around, Obama had job growth that was about 3% faster than we're seeing now. Uh, Trump said if he got in, we would see 4, 5, 6% GDP growth. His GDP growth numbers, that's the gross domestic product or the size of the economy, have been average for the last 70 years, so nothing spectacular there. Um, you know, he inherited a very good situation, and he has managed so far not to completely screw it up. On the other hand, farm bankruptcies are on the rise. Uh, the American Midwest is suffering seriously because of this, and he's replaced uh, market activity, selling corn and soybeans to China, uh, with instead uh, welfare, about $28 billion of it so far. Um, I think he's, he's, he's enjoyed the benefits of what was a strong and growing economy, but there's no indication he's done anything to improve it, with one exception. By allowing polluters to pollute, he is allowing them to increase their profits. On the other hand, um, I won't live to have this happen to me, but my grandchildren and their children, more of them will have cancer and heart disease and asthma because the air in America is literally getting dirty and the water in America is getting less clean, undoing policies that have been improving these things for almost 50 years. 
And you mentioned Ivanka earlier on in the conversation about yeah. Donald Trump wanting to be an emperor and she'd be the empress that followed him. There is something, well, to my mind, there's something strange about uh, the way she has been placed in the centre of that administration in, in, in a sense. How do you read it? Well, uh, you could, of course, see this as simple nepotism. But the one person in the world Donald is close to is his daughter, Ivanka, who you may recall, he said, you know, if she wasn't my daughter, I'd be dating her. Mm -hmm. um, he, Donald Trump runs a third generation white collar crime family. He has spent his entire life cheating workers, investors, the people who thought they were going to be students at Trump University. Um, he's, he's a con artist. And he runs a very small operation in business in which the people around him were either family or people who were highly dependent on him once they compromised themselves and gotten involved. And Donald uh, doesn't want to have outside people. I mean, he's operating without a real chief of staff, for example. Uh, he's been unable to attract and retain people for government positions. And Ivanka and Jared, her husband, he trusts because they're part of the family and inside the family people trust one another uh, but they're not qualified in any way for the jobs that they're holding and when people say that the family the wider family including ivanka and jared and um melania that they all have a kind of stockholm syndrome and that's why they're still in there what do you say to that i mean i my instinct is you know they're grown adults they're making choices but what what's your uh, no, I think you're right about that. Uh, when Donald Trump divorced his first wife and repeatedly publicly humiliated her back in 1990 or so, uh, his three older children would have nothing to do with him. In fact, Ivanka wrote a book about how she would have nothing to do with him. Then they grew up. They looked around at the world and realized no one would take care of them financially the way daddy would. And he bought them back. And I've interviewed people who've told me stories about how uh, being at a photo shoot, uh, Donald was once handed his daughter Tiffany by his then wife Marla Maples, who said, uh, hold Tiffany for a moment. And Donald jumped back and there was a revulsion about this. Uh, this when was she a man, was a baby. You know, when she was a baby. And when he also made a comment about, you know, will she look, will, how will she grow up? And he cupped his hands over himself and said, well, we don't know if she'll be like her mother. I mean, this is a man who's a, a, a he makes Philistine an embarrassing word, but he's a Philistine. He has no culture. He has no knowledge of world events. He he does not understand, for example, in the Middle East, the difference between a Sunni and a Shia and why it matters. Um, and so it's important to understand Donald is, is conned people. He has no knowledge. Of one of the things Donald claims to be the world's greatest expert on 22 subjects. One of them is a subject on which I'm a world-recognized authority, taxes. And he also says under oath he knows nothing of accounting. Well, not knowing accounting, you cannot know taxes. You cannot. <laughs> Thank you, David. Interesting to get your perspective, David K. Johnston. That's the most important thing of all, winning the trust of people that have put their trust in us, many of them for the first time, and Boris will have my full support as he does that. Well, I don't know why he's talking to a tree.